Dr. Speak. Hey, Charles, how are you doing? Good, how are you doing? Yeah, good. So we're wandering lost around corridors again, looking again. for uh, uh, various members of the Avalon team to uh, go and... Uh, uh, chase down an ambush. So um, cool. And today we're, we're looking for uh, Greg Schechter, who's uh, one of the uh, architects in uh, Avalon. He's a uh, guy who's uh, been around uh, a for a long while. Yeah, and we're going to see if we can go go deep, really, kind of get a bit of a sort of sense of you know what what goes on behind the covers in Avalon. You know, when you sort of do some stuff with uh, Avalon, quite how it kind of fits in under the covers, where the uh, you know, where the mill comes in, where the uh -huh. DWM comes in. Where all the real things, work so. is going on. Yeah, kind of how those things sit together. So, Excellent. Uh, here we are. This is Greg. How's it going? Good. How are you? <laughs> Good to see you. This is Charles. How are you doing? Charles. You're on nice Channel 9. Good to meet you. Good to you. <laughs> all right. So Do you always walk around with that? Huh? Do you always walk around with that? <laughs> yeah, that's what I get paid to do, man. Have you not seen his bathroom series? It's kind of quite yeah, an interesting no, one. I don't so. really oh, yeah. Want to. <laughs> yeah, we can't put those on channel. That's true. Yeah. That's kind of uh, the after 9 p.m. one. So, so I'm just going to uh, set this up. up. So, Greg, just whilst we're sitting here, tell us a bit about yourself. Tell us what you what you do in Avalon. So, we're right, we're right going. Yeah, we really are. No messing around. <laughs> so, uh, a couple of things. I started out as, uh, on Avalon as an architect on the uh, media integration layer. Uh -huh. Stuff mostly on programming model and, and uh, graphics and media APIs and, and such. Um, and then about you know two years ago or so, we started getting into the desktop window manager. So I drove the development effort of that and architecture and that stuff and, mm -hmm. uh, and kind of doing both. Excellent. And what, what, is, what does an architect do in this? I mean, we've got PMs and devs and testers. What, what, what role does an architect play? Is this like a three-way fight with the PMs and the devs to get Pretty the much. vision implemented? Pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Seat here. yeah so, um, That's a good question. I mean, it really varies. I mean, it's, you know, there's, you know, you know lots of different architects and we're all sure. different. We all have different, have different goals and um, interests and stuff, so. Uh, but, you know, the stuff I like to do is, is um, Programming model stuff, see the usage of the system, and also building systems. I mean, we've been building the uh, window manager for a while. I haven't been doing as much individual dev work on it, more, right. more project management. So that's sort of non-architectural stuff, but also some architectural stuff with right. respect to the whole, the whole thing and how it all fits together. Yeah. So I see. I mean, the Outlook on your machine is which? Which do you spend more time in Outlook, Visual Studio, or PowerPoint? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Outlook. Everybody's an Outlook. Right. Person, yeah. <laughs> cool. cool. So, yeah, um, I don't want to be focused on that machine, that's the fact. Let's close all those yeah. down quick before... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Secret messages. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I mean, you, you've talked already there a little bit about the, the mill, the media integration layer, and uh, the DWM, the desktop windowing manager. And, and, you know, it's kind of interesting, you know, we're here in Avalon land, which I guess a lot of people think of as uh, about managed APIs and about the managed framework. But right. Avalon really is about more than that, isn't it? Can you just give us a sense of the other components and how they all... Yeah, yeah, so, so the... the Public exposure of Avalon is definitely um, uh, is definitely through managed APIs for version one certainly, and however it's built on you know there's presentation framework presentation core um, exposes all of the public APIs but that's built upon some unmanaged components. Um, there's a library that we have internally called Millcore DLL that has all the uh, unmanaged mostly graphics rendering both both. 2D and 3D rendering and composition mm -hmm. stuff as part of it. Um, the, the, the scene walker, effectively, the scene walker for rendering contents on the display. Um, and, uh, and that's all an unmanaged code. That's also written on top of DirectX, which, of course, is an unmanaged API as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Now, the DirectX does have a managed component. Yeah, there's managed DirectX, yeah. um, which is, is built on top of obviously on top of DirectX, yeah. but uh, it's different than what we do in Avalon. So Avalon has a 3D component as well, uh -huh. and the the crux of the 3D component in Avalon is really integration with the rest of the Avalon system. So you can do things like take take 2D stuff that you generate in Avalon and start mapping that onto 3D, or you make you create 3D models using the 3D subsystem and integrate it very nicely with 2D components. So there's a, there's a um, um, composability aspect to what, what you do in Avalon 3D that really is outside the realm of what the Managed DirectX work does. The Managed DirectX, the audience for Managed DirectX is really the audience for DirectX who wants to use managed code to access it. So Understood. Okay. Right. So, you, I mean, you're kind of painting this picture of like the, the managed stuff that everybody sees and the unmanaged stuff that's doing the kind of dirty work behind the, behind the scenes. Can you give us some kind of sense of how much 
of the code base is, is managed versus unmanaged for Avalon? That's a good question. <laughs> um, best you're going to get is a guess for me. Um, in the, uh, I mentioned presentation framework, presentation core, there's the split that isn't really broadly known, but those are the two managed DLLs that we have. And um, uh, the presentation framework is the one that really brings in the framework concepts like data binding, um, uh, like some of the layout stuff, some of the eventing stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the presentation core DLL is really the underlying media APIs, the public disclosure of the underlying media APIs mm -hmm. uh, and, and graphics and text and mm -hmm. all that, the, the rendering stuff and the basic UI element. Um, so if you look at that part, the presentation core and below is the core portion of Avalon and the framework portion of Avalon, those two separate things. The I say that the majority of code that comprises the core is really unmanaged. Right. And there's still a lot of managed code in there, but, um, but probably more in the unmanaged space. Right, right, right. And as far as ratios between framework and core, I, I don't know. I, I right. Make something up. I don't know. <laughs> well, I guess in terms of the PM teams, they're kind of what, nearly 50 50, roughly speaking, with that? I don't know that. Yeah, yeah. That sort of yeah, has any kind of semblance in terms of right. code written, but it's right, right. one kind of rough guide, yeah. I guess, perhaps. So, um, Let's talk through, you've mentioned some things like scene walking and things like that. Mm -hmm. Let's just talk through at the, the, the mill level before we drill down even deeper. Just the process that takes place. I mean, let's say you've got a window on screen with a bunch of stuff going on, perhaps a you know, media element playing some stuff and some mm -hmm. 2D, 3D uh, graphics. What, what kind of goes on in the unmanaged side once you've got that? I mean, you've got like your, your framework tree, yeah. right? But there's yeah. also another tree over that side. Yeah, can maybe, you talk can I try to draw some? It would be perfect, please. absolutely perfect. Okay, let me erase. So um, ultimately, when you write an Avalon application, you create this big tree. And this tree, the Avalon application programmer sometimes thinks about a uh, logical tree and a visual tree. Mm -hmm. And if, if you don't know about the distinction there, don't really worry about it. It's not as germane to this conversation. But the, this tree that I'm talking about here that the application creates, we call the visual tree. This is. This is the visual tree specifically that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, now, this exists on the UI thread of the application and is created in managed code, managed Avalon. Uh, and there's a transport that happens right at this layer that effectively replicates this tree. Draw it differently, of course, but it basically replicates this tree on what's called the render thread. And it's not really replicating everything. Like, for instance, raw image data is going to be shared between the two in, in the local machine case. Um, but it's effectively replicating the tree. And stuff that might be off screen on this tree might not make it down to this tree because it's off screen. Right. But the, you know, the, the higher order bit is really that there's a replicated tree here. And then this render thread is a thread. So it's going spinning around. And this is the guy that owns the DirectX, um, the DirectX device. So as this thing spins around, it's, it's making a walk of this tree and rendering content, you know, rendering, uh, rendering your stick figure or whatever, mm -hmm. rendering your UI, right. rendering everything, because everything in Avalon ultimately comes down to this visual tree, uh -huh. which ultimately gets transferred across into this, into this render thread. I'm going to switch over here because yeah. it's sunlight. Okay. Um, so and, and you talk here about a thread. Um, I mean. Does that mean that Avalon is, is, is a single thread from a, from a programming perspective? Yes. So from a programming perspective, up here, the application um, manipulates the user interface thread. Mm -hmm. right? And it is a single threaded application. So it's the, it's the application's responsibility to make sure that all interactions with uh, stuff on the application thread happens on things built on the application thread happen on that application thread. Right. And there's various mechanisms to make sure that you do that. Right. So just like windfalls, exactly. you have to synchronize with the, uh, That's right. the UI thread yeah. before doing any work. Yeah. And, there, and there's nice approaches to, if you want to do off-thread work, to, uh, um, to effectively invoke back on that, on that UI thread so right. that you can manipulate the UI thread objects. Right. Now this thread down here is separate and it's not visible. This render thread is not visible to the programmer. But it does provide a 
level of multi-threadedness that's, that's nice because for one thing, the render thread is not waiting on the user interface to complete. Mm -hmm. and, and on the other side of it, the user interface isn't waiting on the render thread. So, you know, this is sort of some inherent uh, parallelism mm -hmm. going on. Good. Um, but, but all of this is processed by a component called millcore.dll, which is our primary unmanaged um, library. And, and actually, I should say there's also Windows Codex. DLL, which contains um, most of the imaging functionality, the right. imaging decode right. functionality and encode also. So this you've got this render thread going on, and it's responsible for drawing your UI, but it's also responsible for receiving edits. So when I make a change up here, when I like disconnect this and draw something else up here by via child add or child remove, things like that, mm -hmm. it all gets translated into a modification to this tree, which gets translated to an edit that gets sent out across this right. channel right. down to this other thread. So it's, and it's not sending the whole thing every that's time. Right. Changes, that's right. right. And uh, we'll get to, uh, to a really important aspect of that in a minute. Um, so it's sending out deltas. And, and then this guy, you know, what it's doing, ostensibly doing, is when it needs to generate the next frame, it goes and makes a complete render traversal and generates the next frame. But it doesn't really do that. Mm -hmm. um, because that would be wasteful if I'm just changing, you know, the button, the checkbox state to checked down here. There's no need to re-render all of this. Sure. So there's a lot of um, smarts up in the upper layers of this mill core, the composition component, that avoids re-rendering subtrees that don't need to be re-rendered. It does dirty region management and, yeah. and occlusion calling potentially. If I change something that's behind here and it's not visible, that maybe won't get rendered at all. Right, right. Um, mm. So so it does all that and sort of optimizes the rendering to that. And then it's responsible for issuing calls down to the lower level portion of Millcore, which is responsible for the actual rendering of the bits mm -hmm. to DirectX. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, um, and, and, and if we want to look at the kind of the boundary between managed and unmanaged code, you're not saying the boundary between the UI thread and the render thread, right? You're saying the boundary is actually a little higher than that in the, in the yes, UI yes, thread? Yes. Um, that's right. So all this, this render thread, it's all unmanaged, uh -huh. but it's it's also the case that this uh, this is really more of a structural diagram than a layering diagram. So, um, which said Tim is, is just right is that most of the application calls to this when you when I'm making editing a visual, for instance, that's mm -hmm. largely implemented in managed code. But um, but but there's unmanaged code up here at this level too, mm -hmm. at the at, um, on the UI thread that's responsible for talking to the render thread. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That so makes sense. So even even with as you say, just sort of sending deltas back and forward between the two trees, it seems like there's got to be a certain overhead in maintaining two separate trees and it's kind of the work in that. Is that is that a significant percentage of time? Is that you know is that an area where we've we've had to do a lot of tuning work or? Yeah, there's there's. Um, from a time perspective, that hasn't really been a problem. Right. Uh, the the bigger problem has really been the data replication uh -huh. one, and really, and, and that's why I mentioned up front that we don't copy image data just because image data is so huge. There's there's sort of structural data that defines the tree that does get copied, but that's you know pretty compact. Mm -hmm. uh, image data um, is is largely shared because it's big. You don't want to have to replicate that. There's other stuff like um, 3D mesh data that I don't believe is shared right now, but it's something to look into right. um, as, as more and more right. those sorts of resources right. get used. Another really important aspect of this architecture is that I mentioned data traveling across this channel here. Uh, and, and the channel is just the means that we have of communicating between threads. But this channel typically is uh, across the same machine, just across, um, you know, it's really in the same process. It's mm -hmm. just shared memory sort of thing. But it can also travel across um, the network. So this, cool. this whole portion of the system can live on a remote client, on a terminal server client, for instance. Mm. And this can live on the server. So as modifications are made up here on the server, again, all that needs to be sent out are edits, which is, and contrast that to uh, a GDI-based application where if you make an update, and the update has to send everything that's changed on the display. Mm -hmm. um, whereas here, what needs to be sent is what's changed structurally 
right. in, in the tree. Right. So it, it really puts a sort of new twist on, on uh, how bandwidth is used in a remote situation. And also, all these primitives, you know, this includes all the 3D meshes and 2D stuff that needs to get tessellated and all that. Right. It's sort of a higher level of communication so that all of this can be offloaded onto the onto the remote desktop client machine. Uh -huh. That's excellent. So what you're saying then is that if I RAS into my machine, uh, uh, sorry, I use the term RAS. I mean, if I remote yeah, access into my machine, mm -hmm. um, I'll be able to run the Avalon UI yeah, in so that window, size. which well, today, when you think about the amount of bandwidth it takes to replicate your real desktop. Right. That's pretty amazing because yeah, of what yeah. you just talked about. I just wanted to reiterate that. Yeah, yeah. So. And that's that's the case for Avalon applications that we're talking about. And we can get into what it means for the Windows Vista window manager experience and how all that works. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for Avalon applications you can you can on your on your server machine, your remote machine, you can start up an Avalon app and have it send across structural information to mm -hmm. your client and take and advantage the performance of performance nice. for on that. Right. That's yeah. excellent. Yeah, yeah. Now, now you kind of bring up the sort of windowing manager, and I kind of want to go into that in a moment and see how that kind of fits into here. But, but just before just before we disappear off this kind of particular part, I'm just interested to know. I mean, like this team has been going for what four years now, roughly. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, we must have. I know we've done major rearchitectures of things at the kind of the the managed level. I'm intrigued to know kind of what things. You know, is this what, how we started off, or what what are the major kind of tipping points or changes that uh, we've made over the last sort of few years? Um, is, is, is it always been like this? That's a great question. Um, I've been with the team for about three and a half years. Um, so I wasn't around for the beginning initial. Right. Thing. But you're right. Some of the bigger upheavals in the system have been at the managed layer, at the uh -huh. programming level layer, at the programming model uh -huh. layers. Um, the notion of a, a, of a separate um, render thread with a composition component and a rendering component uh, that's able to receive remote information has been there for, as far as I know, since day one. Right. Um, and, uh, um, you know, the changes have been more along the lines of emphasis, the sorts of things that have been emphasized rather than the actual structure mm -hmm. of, of the system. Right. Um, there was that change around the UI thread, there wasn't there? I mean, I remember once upon a time we used to talk about rental threaded uh, yes. models for yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's up here, UI side. Really. Right, um, right. And, uh, there, there, there was the change from rental threaded to single threaded apartment uh -huh. model, and the the difference there is that in a rental threaded model, you can have a uh, have a thread that owns all these resources, but that thread can change. You can hand it off from one thread to another. So someone's renting the thread, right. um, but only one person can be in there at a time. Uh -huh. Where a single threaded apartment is it's always owned by a single thread. Right. The reason we had to back off and stick with single threaded is um, really because of Win32 interop issues that uh -huh. really require SDA right. model. Anyhow, and just so many Avalon applications, WPF applications, require some amount of uh, interaction and integration with Win32 components mm -hmm. that we really had to go there. Right. The other thing about rental threaded is it's, it's, it's different again from free threaded, which just means any thread, any time. Right. And it's really, so between single threaded and rental threaded, they're both only using one thread at a time. So yeah. you can't really take advantage of multi-core systems right. with either rental threaded or single threaded. Right. You still have to do work yourself to do off-thread sure. work. Sure. So are you gonna so as Avalon evolves though, are you gonna change that model? I mean clearly what you're saying is it's you're using STA because that's what you're restricted to by yeah. the platform. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's gonna of course change with multi-core and I'm sure you guys will address that. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with multi-core to some extent, but as I was saying, anyway, just moving to RTA, rental mm -hmm. thread, doesn't really help the multi-core situation. Um, it just means it could be handed off to different threads. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not we vi revisit going back to rental thread, I think that's going to depend upon our customer feedback and, and the uses that people find or desire for a rental, a rental mm -hmm. model here, mm -hmm. or whether single's just fine and, mm -hmm. and they find more of a need to... Uh, to spin off separate threads and have better support for separate thread communication back to the main UI thread. Right. That's right. probably what will happen. Yeah, yeah. So let's move on now. We kind of talked about the kind of the Avalon pieces if you're writing a WPF application, but yeah. obviously one of the biggest sort of places that people will see some of this stuff in action is just in the Windows Vista shell, right? That's I mean, right. Things like Flip 3D and the thumbnail views when you kind of hover over stuff. And we've done some videos around some of that stuff, right, Charles? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so 
does that use any of this stuff, or is that entirely a different model? Slightly funny, different question. Funny you <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the desktop window manager in Windows Vista does use uh, Millcore DLL. It's uh -huh. the other component in the system that uses There's effectively two components, uh, uh, Avalon, WPF, and, uh, and the Windows Vista window manager. So Millcore.dll is not currently a public API, so we're, you know, those, those really are the two components right. that use it. And absolutely, the, the window manager is just an application from the Millcore's point of view. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the uh, let me erase a little bit. I'm going to erase this top portion, which was the UI thread. I'm going to replace it with a you know, window list, top level window list that a user maintains. Um, the user 32 maintains. And then the DWM component, desktop window manager component, that, and this is a very simplified diagram, but it effectively references this list of windows and builds up a tree that represents the desktop, where each node below the top level is a new window, is, is one of these windows. Mm -hmm. um, and then each one of these windows has different aspects to it. It has its has its client area, uh, has its main client area, right? And then it's got a bunch of adornments on the non-client area, like the close button, and the icon, and the text, the mm -hmm. caption text, and all that. So every window is like that. I mean, there's obviously different window styles, but you can think of the window, the desktop itself, as just a big um, uh, visual tree. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what it is in, in Vista. So this information, again, gets communicated across the channel down to the render thread. Um, and the build core composition system is responsible for, again, cycling over that and rendering and stuff and using the same dirty region management that I talked about so that when you move one window a little bit, you don't update the entire screen. Or not even when you move a window, but when you get a client area update, when you're typing away in Microsoft Word, mm -hmm. you just update that little portion because the smarts in here to do the um, to do the dirty region management and optimization or kick in. Kick now, in is place. there a relationship between um, going with a tree model and the synchronization that you're talking about in terms of uh, updating specific pieces of a map, really, and uh, then rendering from there? So I guess my question is, since this is a going deep, is why the, w the visual tree model? Talk about this tree, and you show us nodes and stuff. Is yeah, well, or is the, that architecture? Is the that? importance of, it, with respect to this, it's not super important that this be a tree. The the main point about what's here is that it's it's a data structure that represents the graphical rendering of the desktop. It could be a graph, right? Okay. It could be multi-connected down here. It could be a well, it couldn't really be a completely flat list of things because you really need this hierarchy where the hierarchy is apparent when you look at, you know, I've got a window and the window's made up of multiple things. I've got this window, that window's made up of multiple things. Furthermore, if I go into Flip 3D, mm -hmm. what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of disconnect this. So say this represents the desktop itself. Mm -hmm. I'm going to disconnect this and make this other thing over here that's a 3D container that has references back to these windows. Right mm -hmm. now, I've got this 3D container that has flipped these windows around. And I'm going to hook that up to here, um, and and the desktop is now going to contain this 3D representation. So the model fits in sure. terms of what we want to do and the flexibility that it gives us. Fantastic. Um, you know, another um, big advantage of doing it this way is what we didn't really talk about is the, sort of the general basics of the window manager. Right, and right. the architectural basics of the window manager and why we went down this path at all. But the main point about the uh, Windows Vista window manager is that it's a composite desktop. Oh. Hmm. So and the the idea there is you know, I'll show you. Show. I'll show. <laughs> yeah. We kind of did. We did a channel nine interview with um, Cam. Yeah. Um, so, so. Uh, yeah, but there's there's an aspect of this that I wanted to show. Yeah, sure. Here, which is you know just like in uh, XP and prior to that, you'd often get these sort of artifacts where you just get these draggy gunk that mm -hmm. takes a little bit to update. Yep. And the reason that that happens is because um, uh, because it's the application's responsibility. So this application back here, Explorer, 
as I move this window around, it's being asked to repaint the areas that have been um, unoccluded. So as it does that, um, uh, it needs to repaint and it needs to bring that application in, and you see disconnectedness. Mm -hmm. right? You see, you see this, these trails back there. So the whole point of a composited desktop is to, well, for one, one artifact of a composited desktop is that stuff doesn't happen anymore. Right. Because what you do is all windows render off screen and have their client areas generated off screen, and then let me turn, turn this back on. And what keystrokes did you press there? Well, for, for pre-release builds, it's control shift F9, but that's going to go away okay. for the release. <laughs> um, uh, so anyhow, I'm doing this, and now it's totally smooth because this application is not being asked to re-render, right? The, the contents are off screen, and mm -hmm. the window manager itself via Milkor, the stuff that we were talking about, mm -hmm. goes ahead and re-renders everything. Uh, and wow. paints everything back up. Very nice. Um, so, you know, it, and because all those things are off screen, you start to get uh, additional opportunities that you previously didn't have. So now we've got these off screen representations and we can do stuff with those. We can, we can see the, um, hang on a sec here. Um, you know, we can see thumbnails of these windows, mm. right? Um, because we've got that off-screen representation that we can put to multiple uses. And in a way, actually, that's one way that that data structure isn't strictly a tree. It's a graph because, right. because it is used in multiple places. Mm -hmm. We're using the same technology to do this sort of stuff, similar technology to the visual brush mm -hmm. work that's available in WPF. Mm -hmm. right. Pretty much all, all of which is in Milcore. Now, it's still vector-based, right? Well, or no. no. <laughs> um, so... So um, Milcore certainly is vector-based, but uh, you know images are in there too. Sure. So all of the um, all of the uh, client areas. Mm -hmm. Now if I go back. Oh wait, I didn't show this. So this is another aspect of thumbnail usage, right? Is live thumbnails for yeah. the alt tab view. But if I go back into this guy, you know, my command window. Where do you go? <laughs> my command window. This our representation of this is just an, an image. Understood. So GDI generates that, yeah. updates this image. And it so happens that the frame here um, is also compo composed of images. Mm -hmm. um, now, it could be that, you know, in, in future versions and whatnot, that this get, the vectors are used for this. Right. Okay. This particular version, it is image based. Was that for perf reasons or? Uh, um, just actually, it was, mostly for, the and no, it was mostly <laughs> for author workflow okay. issues that the our, our design team mm -hmm. being at, at this point most comfortable mm -hmm. working with images and right. being able to do great great work with images. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So uh, that's cool. That kind of explains that. So it's one thing that really blew my mind, and I discovered this just a, a week or two ago, and, and I really wasn't expecting it. And perhaps I should have been expecting it, but, I, but anyway, I wasn't. <laughs> I'm just a humble evangelist here, right? So I was uh, playing around with the magnifier, you know, the ease of access magnifier uh -huh. thing uh -huh. that kind of scales up for yes. kind of partially sighted people. And I just happened to move my mouse over a WPF app. Yes. And rather than doing this kind of blocky kind of blow up yep. thing, it was showing, it wasn't just doing it, it was doing the full vector yeah. rendering as if I had like a visual brush or something yeah. like that. And that blew my mind because that was like an, an unmanaged app, right? right it's right. Not, not doing the kind of visual brush kind of thing. So can you just explain to me yeah, how that works? Um, that's, that's a great, great question. Um, so, you know, this model mm -hmm. and this composite desktop really starts to introduce a lot of, opens up a lot of doors. So, what happens, let me get rid of this little represent, flip 3D representation. Go back to here, where we had this um, desktop here. So the way magnifier works is it basically puts in another window right here, mm -hmm. and it has to hook it up to the desktop. So this is another window, and it's got its accoutrements off to the side, its caption button and text and all that. Um, but for its content, what it does is it comes back around and points back at itself, almost. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna make a dotted line here. Um, it comes back around and points at itself, and before it does that, it, it annotates this with a transformation. So what this says is, for my client area, I want the desktop itself, but I want it bigger, mm -hmm. right? So when, just like when uh, transforms are applied in Avalon, 
um, you apply a transform and it actually renders post transform transformation right. so that right. it doesn't get blocky, it re-renders at the right scale. Mm -hmm. Same here. This tree passes down to the node core uh, render thread and renders at the larger size. So for WPF content, mm -hmm. um, it has the primitives there and it's able to render the primitives there, so it just makes those right. bigger. Now, um, uh, I, I said sort of here, because if you if you look at this, you see that this really doesn't work. Because what, what would happen here is you magnify this thing, which would magnify this, which would come back and magnify itself. So there's smarts in here that filter out the magnifier window right. itself. Um, it's a bit like when you take a camcorder and record the television, yes. the output is routing through, it kind of becomes this kind of window in a window kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, now, a little bit of what I said here is inaccurate in that um, in the window manager, this window, this window content right here, say this is my WPF app, mm -hmm. this does not contain all of the primitives for WPF, right? Those are, and, and this is, actually let me step away from that a little bit. Um, the way desktop composition works mm -hmm. is applications render to an Austrian buffer. So GDI applications render to a separate GDI surface. Those are provided in. Um, uh, the, the, those are are then pulled by the window manager process as images. So there's not a direct connection. It's not like the. Uh, it's it's not a one big process space. GDI applications drop their bits somewhere. Window manager picks them up. Right. Same with WPF applications. They drop their bits into a direct X surface. Window manager picks them up. So then that begs the question: Well, how does this stuff work? How does the WPF mm -hmm. application know about mm -hmm. the um, window about the magnifier. Right. And the way that works is that there's some communication that WPF applications do know about magnifiers. Right. Um, and when they're asked to render under the context of a magnifier, they render larger. Right. Um, now, is that hard, that's not hard coded to the Windows magnifier, right? So theoretically, if you yeah. had some other accessibility. That's right. Accessibility vendors have the opportunity to plug in their own. Right. Right. Their own, uh, magnifiers. Okay. Cool. Um, that's really clever. I mean, just, you know, it's the kind of thing that. I didn't expect to yeah. see because I thought by that stage, you know, although you've got this window here is showing in the space, this is the DWM that we're looking at here rather than the, the UI thread sort of Avalon piece. And I was like, how does that yeah, connect yeah. back into that? And there must be some smarts there that right. kind of picks that up and, uh, and clearly that's the case. So we've, we've shown here two uses of this, this kind of the mill and the stuff underneath that. Um, and and um, you kind of mentioned that this isn't a public API, like the render thread I can't get into right. from my own code. But is that kind of like an aspiration? Is that something that we might consider for future releases? Or what yeah, use cases I, might that I, work I think I think we do have um, a desire to take the Milcordial functionality, mm -hmm. at least, in some variant of its present form, right. and, and make and put public APIs on that. Okay. No, no, we don't have a design on that. We don't have timelines on it or anything. But there certainly is a goal. I mean, we want. We know that this is useful functionality. We know that there are many applications out there that would want to be able to make use of this level of functionality mm -hmm. um, that can't go whole hog into WPF for a variety of reasons. Right. Um, and uh, and it's it's good technology. Um, cool. Cool. So um, I'm kind of, kind of dream, keen now to drill down even lower down below that. So we talked about the, the render thread and we talked about how it uses things like Direct3D to actually deposit its stuff on the screen. Um, but I know the other, another area that uh, you've spent a lot of time thinking about and um, your reinvigorated blog has got some awesome sort of posts around is the subject of the WDDM, yes, yes, which yes. is the Windows Vista device driver model. Is that the right expansion? I think it's just WDDM. Oh, just and win it's just, Windows, it's Windows Display Driver model. We might use it for a post-Vista release. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, so how does that tie in with this and, and DirectX? And, and most specifically, I know Charles and I were talking on the way over and we were, we were discussing, you know, where does this fit in? Um, or why is Vista a better platform for WPF than, than XP? Or is it a better platform than XP? Yeah, so one of the key so Windows Vista um, desktop window manager, desktop mm -hmm. window manager, will not run on all Vista machines out there. Right. One of the requirements is to have a WDDM driver. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is because we're rendering your desktop, right? So there, and, and it's using the graphics processing unit to do that. There's other applications that might be using the GPU, including WPF applications, but also just any DirectX application. So it's quite possible that without some um, uh, 
some sort of global scheduling, your desktop will hang because some other application used a lot of it. Or you'll run out of video memory, right? Because you've right. opened up too many windows. Right. That's not an acceptable experience for Windows. Mm -hmm. um, so Windows requires WDDM. Now what WDDM gets you is virtualization. I mean, in a word, it gets you virtualization. And, and what I mean by that is it, it virtualizes graphics memory mm -hmm. and it virtualizes graphics processing. Graphics memory from the point of view of just like, you know, the uh, Windows, forget about graphics, just the regular memory subsystem in Windows. If you run out of memory, it gives you disk and you've got the virtual memory system, right? So it moves over to secondary storage. With WDDM, if you run out of graphics memory and you're requesting graphics memory, it's going to fall over to system memory and right. virtualizes the graphics memory into the system memory. So you've effectively got uh, infinite amount of video memory because if system memory, if you run out of system memory, it rolls over into a disk, just like mm -hmm. the virtual memory system. Right. Um, so you know, there's there's certainly different performance characteristics. Mm -hmm. say, yeah. Those different tiers, but it's there and this memory is virtualized. So that's one super important thing. Um, the other really important thing is virtualization of computation on the GPU. So the way DirectX works is you give it a command buffer, a bunch of things to do. Each application is giving the, the DirectX system a command buffer and stuff to do. With WDDM, that um, command buffer is interruptible and preemptible, so you can you can run your command and then some other application can get in. And then there's a scheduling algorithm that goes in and decides who's going to get the computation. Um, now, with with DirectX 9, which is what D, which is what DWM is based upon. Uh, it's interruptible at the at the level of the command buffer, but by commands in the buffer. But within a command, you can't interrupt things. Now that can potentially be an issue because you might have a really complex shader, pixel shader involved, that's rendering across a very large primitive, like a triangle, the size of your display, and that can't be interrupted under DirectX 9. Uh, so it's a potential area where things can can uh, tie up and not get virtualized and not get switched out of. But it hasn't really proven to be an issue. And then DirectX 10 has a model called the Advanced Scheduler, which does allow interruptibility within a primitive, within a shader, uh, which is really, which is really key as more and more things start using that right, right. that system. Okay. So, um, so as as this tree is being traversed down here, DirectX commands are being issued, mm -hmm. and uh, and those are all playing well with other applications on the system. Mm -hmm. And this is. This is one of the big reasons why, this is the big reason why Window Manager requires DWM, WDDM mm -hmm. and why it's not available on XP because WDDM is not available on right. XP. Right. But Avalon runs on XPDM. Avalon just through happily, right? Yeah. What, what kind of, uh, in practical terms, I'm just thinking of the kind of real world applications that people watching this video might be building, what are the kind of things they might want to steer away from if they know they need to support the XPDM? I mean, are there any kind of things like having multiple windows or you know, particular things that are going to really stress those kind of you know, non-virtualized scenarios particularly heavily? I think the main dangers there are interactions between applications because any given application can choose to you know, effectively scale itself back and say, hey, you know, I've got my application is made up of four windows and I'm mm -hmm. going to make sure that I don't issue commands and starve to the extent of starving by other right. colleagues, my right. other three windows that are going on. Um, that becomes difficult when you're running multiple applications. And, you know, I think it really is going to be largely scenario-based. I mean, if you're running in a more constrained environment and you know what your user's running. Right. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, I mean, to some extent, it's going to be a user experience thing. The user is going to detect that they're running multiple things and it's slowing things down, so they're going to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be self-correcting in, right. in that sense. Right. Yeah. Is there any test you can do from Avalon to see whether you're running against an XPDM or a WDDM driver? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know of... There may be. The one that I can think of is not a sort of sandbox managed API. If you get the DirectX capabilities, you can look for a particular capability flag that says whether or not the surfaces are shared. Right. And if they are, that's an indication that it's the WDDM. Right, right. Um, that's how we do it. Right. There may be, there, you know, there's tiering, the tiering APIs in yeah. WPF. I don't know enough about that to know whether or not they give you that information. Right. 
Yeah, my, my understanding of that is it's more, is it DirectX 7 or DirectX 9 in terms of you know, what's in hardware? So you, I think tier 2 is DirectX 9 hardware accelerator. But it, I, I, I've not seen anything, so I, I was asking as a ignorant sort of you know, developer. Yeah, yeah, I don't, there I don't know. Of you can certainly get it through native code, through DirectX capabilities. Right, right. Cool. So, I mean, just wrapping up, um, you know, I mean, through this, this project, you say you've been on, on this for like three and a half years. Have you seen any any surprises? I mean, what, sort of since the start, what, what kind of things have sort of, were you not expecting perhaps in terms of kind of sample apps that you're seeing developed on this stuff or, um, you know, any any usage patterns or the way that things have changed that have evolved your thinking over this, this time that has, you know, been non-obvious to you? <laughs> um... Yeah, I suspect so, but I'm just like, I'm not, no, nothing's popping to mind. I mean, I know there are, right. but it, 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 it's not just, it's not coming. Cool. <laughs> um, um, uh, but, but there are a couple other things that I realized I didn't mention here uh -huh. so much, which is, and this is an important one, the, we talked about remoting of WPF applications. Right. We didn't really talk about remoting of the desktop window manager okay. itself. Yeah. Mm. Because this just follows. I mean, you know, when I describe it, because of what we talked about earlier, it'll mm -hmm. be kind of obvious. The um, uh, we've got this window. We've got this window tree up here that represents the desktop. This can remote just as well as any WPF application can. Uh -huh. So you can send this across the uh, terminal, the, a remote desktop boundary across the network. Mm -hmm. So that means that when you're running on the right configuration of client and server machine, you're able to remote your desktop and get the same effects that you get in the local case um, on the remote case. And you can do Flip 3D, for instance, and that's all processed on the client. Mm -hmm. Because you wanted to say in terms of, you said things that you, you meant to say, or you, you talked about remoting. Was um, so you've, you've seen all the business about Flip and Flip 3D right. with live content moving all right, that. Okay. Right, yeah. Cam shows that. Yeah. So, so I guess just one last question then before we close is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not far from V1 now. We're, yeah. It's so exciting to see after all this time that we're, you know, about six, nine months away from, uh, from RTM. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what you see as the big themes or moving forward, where you see the next big challenges that we've got to deal with for, uh, you know, V2 and beyond. Yeah. You know, what does your five-year radar look like? I think they're on a couple of levels. What is um, um, how in what ways to evolve the desktop mm -hmm. uh, with respect to desktop window manager stuff. You know, we've invested a lot up until this point in getting um, getting the composited desktop to be a reality. And there's a huge amount of application compatibility work that has to do, happen to make that occur. And, and we're still seeing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's also just the, the mechanics of getting GDI to render off screen, getting DirectX to render off screen, bringing it all together. And, you know, we, we've got, we, we benefited from the fruits of that to some extent because we've got this composited system and it's, it's great. And we've, we've exploited a few areas of interest from that, like Flip 3D and Hover Thumbnails and uh, Alt Tab changes in the glass and whatnot. But there's a lot more that we can do. Right. And I think one, once, now that we have this sort of infrastructure of the, um, underlying composite desktop, we can really open that up and do a lot mm -hmm. more, uh, you know, a lot of really interesting stuff beyond what we, the interesting stuff that we've done thus far. Right. Um, so that's one area. Another area is the um, uh, web integration scenarios for WPF, mm -hmm. I think, and, and really generating content on the server machine, um, on, on web servers, and since booing it down to uh, to client machines, and really being able to take advantage of a rich client on the on the client machine, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. really finding the right paradigms for that that leverage the best of the server world and ASP.NET, and Atlas, mm -hmm. and all that, mm -hmm. uh, in conjunction with the you know good stuff that lives on the client, and yeah. really being able to mm -hmm. apply, apply that. I think there's a lot of great challenges there. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. Um, yeah, and then the third one is. Some of the stuff that we talked about about potentially exposing the core uh -huh. um, and what can be done, what can be done with that. Right. So, but so, so just as a general question about about private, I mean, for some reason, I mean, clearly, core system components of Windows we keep them private for obvious reasons. Um, what is what's the case with like what would make Mill Core publicly accessible? In other words. What kind of changes would you make? Is it really an issue of documentation? 
an issue of explaining what the method is, the classes, that stuff? There's that, but I think the first step would be a sort of thorough API review and cleanup. The API is not at all structured for public consumption, okay. um, which has to include versionability, um, uh, standard calling mechanisms and ref counting mechanisms and such. Uh, just anything that, you know, if something that to show on MSDN we'd be proud of showing, yeah. right? It doesn't mean we built the wrong thing for what we've done now for a private sure. API because it's a very tightly controlled environment that is being used there. But there's a lot to do to sort of make that publicly accessible. And a set of um, uh, a set of applications that prove to us that we put the right things in there and that not everyone has to replicate the exact same boilerplate for every one of their applications, which can just get out of hand quickly. Sure. Understood. Sure. I mean, it's, it's a good explanation of, of the difference between a private and public API. Right, right. right. Yeah. Fantastic. Greg, it's been just awesome yeah. chatting with you. Yeah. It's uh, you. not often we get a chance to do this, so uh, thank you for, right. for your time. And, uh, yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Look forward to it again in the future. Good luck. Thank Thanks. you.